Hey, y'all, good morning. You were the people that were supposed to be there at sunrise service and didn't go, aren't you? You're the ones. I heard there was a group that didn't make it, and so you're it and do that. So uh, that was early. Goodness. Uh, that's the first sunrise I've seen in decades. I don't know, man. I'm more of a night person. I, I'm like, wow. It is beautiful, though, if you ever want to try it. I highly recommend it. But maybe once a year, that's enough for all of us and do that. OK? Resurrection Sunday. Ready for a good morning? I was going to turn that to the side. I'll put that here. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Uh, just a great chance to come into a house of worship. Uh, we can't do this in every country in the world. People are meeting underground today in Saudi Arabia and China, Iran. Father, remind us we live in the greatest country in the history of the world. We need to be thankful. We need to be grateful. We need to be thankful that we can publicly worship you. The day's coming where we probably can't publicly. We need to be thankful, use our time wisely. But in this country here, Father, we need to be people that accept your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins, and then serve you mightily all the days of our life. So, Father, use this talk today to encourage the believers to stand up stro stronger and bolder than they ever have been, and, Father, to draw anyone who is not born again and saved that today is the day of salvation for them, Father. So we'll just put it in your hands. We just speak truth, and you do all the rest with your Holy Spirit. So we thank you for that, and we do. And we ask it in the great name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, who's heard me speak before? Who's heard me speak? Okay. So uh, do you remember how I start normally? Yeah, okay. So you remember me well. The snapping guy, as one guy said. Remember I tell you, every second, two people die, Okay. By the time you put your head on a pillow tonight, another 150,000 people have taken their last breath, walked off from eternity, heaven or hell as we speak. Okay, simple question, okay? Uh, if you're a believer, do you care about those two people that just died? Okay, but do you care enough to do something about where those two people are going to spend eternity that just died? Okay? Now, if you're not a believer, that day is coming for all of us, isn't it? Yes? Come on, for all of us. Um, I played college basketball, and um, in December, one of my teammates uh, up in Kissimmee, Florida, uh, had a heart attack and died, 53 years old. And uh, Frank and I got in touch the last couple years of his life. Uh, he reached out to me, and we had some great talks about Jesus Christ because he was wearing down quick. I just got another phone call that one of my other teammates just got ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And so I called Gary up, and after a few questions, we started talking about who? Jesus Christ, because he's wearing out quick. You could hear it in the phone, okay? He's wearing out quick. But I know we're all going out there onto the other side. The question is, where am I going? That's what I wanted to figure out as I began to search all this out a few years ago, okay? Um, so one thing I would look at uh, as I tried to figure this out, one thing that hit me was creation, Okay, this creation that we're in today had to come from somewhere. Um, and if you think about where you live at or you're visiting, you're living in a pretty gorgeous place, are you not? And, and you just look at this, and I began to wonder, this either happened by the hand of God or this happened by luck and by chance over time. One of the two. I got to figure out which one it is, okay, since I'm heading towards the other side and do that, all right? So uh, something simple. I like to logically think as I figure things out. So something very simple. You can look at creation, design, art, and order. Okay, so every creation you see, like a shirt, had a creator. Uh, design. Every watch or every phone, that design had a designer that made. Okay, uh, artwork. Every time you see a piece of artwork on the wall there or something, you know there was an artist that made that. Okay, order. If you see twenty Coke cups in a row, you know there's an orderer who put those there. So when you look around the universe, what do you see? You see creation, you see the design, you see art, you see order. And it hit me. If there's a creator, designer, and artist in order to all this other stuff, there would have to be a creator, and designer, artist, in order to the universe we live in. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's actually very logical. And this is what kind of hit me, because when I was younger, I used to think uh, the Christian folk had blind faith. 
And that always bothered me because I was a straight-A student, I was a thinker, I'm all this kind of stuff. I need evidence for things. And I always thought it was a blind faith, but the more I dug into it, it had nothing to do with having a blind faith. Zero had to do it. And I just didn't know that as a lost guy. But some people chatted with me, and I began to research and do that. Um, I was in... uh, um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was talking to an atheist one day on the streets of Atlanta, and we were standing on a street corner, and there was a huge skyscraper. I mean, just gigantic, kind of like downtown Sanibel. And uh, it was uh, <laughs> literally 45 or 50 stories, and I pointed to this skyscraper, and he was an atheist. I said, do me a favor. He said, what? I said, prove to me there's a builder to that building. He looked at me. He said, that's easy. What's the proof there's a builder? What's the proof? The building's the proof, right? I don't have to meet him or her, but I know he or she exists because of the handiwork that they did, right? So simple. The sun, the moon, the stars, the ocean, the sand, your DNA, three billion pieces to your DNA, yet different from the person next to you. That's fascinating to think about. There had to be somebody that put all this together. I was in uh, Atlanta. We have a big concert place called uh, Phillips Arena at State Farm Arena now. But I'll hand out there and hand out gospel tracts to people walking in, talk with people. So I handed this guy a gospel tract. He said, no, no, I don't want that. I said, why? I said, I'm an atheist. And uh, so he knew it was something about Jesus, so he didn't want it. So he's walking past me. I said, sir, a question for you. And he kept walking. I said, do you believe you have a soul or a spirit? He said, yeah. Yeah. I said, sir, energy can't be created nor destroyed. So something has to happen with your soul or spirit when you die. Heaven or hell, reincarnate, blend back in the universe. Something has to happen with it, correct? He took a step. He looked back. He said, good point, okay? (laughs) He He turned around a second time and said, good point, okay? See how simple you can just use logic with that and figure it out, but I wanted to make that man think that he can just look around him and see the evidence that he's really looking for and do that, okay? Uh, Romans chapter 1 says, for the invisible things of God, okay, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So if you look at the creation, you can see his handiwork without actually having to see him and know he made it, all right? And it says, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And what he says in the Bible is, the day you meet him, you will be without excuse because you should have looked at the creation, you should have sat on the beach, you should have looked at that sunset. Okay, who made this place? And then you figure it out from there. And if you don't do that, you have no excuse the moment you meet God because that's what you should have been doing. Here's another easy way to look at it. If I put a computer right there, I put a robot right here, I put a 747 airplane right here, and I put a worm right here, okay? And you ask any scientist, what is the most intricately designed out of those four, which one will they always tell you? The worm, when you study how an eye system works, how a digestive system works, it's very intricately designed. But wait. We know the computer had a Craner designer. We know the uh, robot had a Craner designer. We know the 747 had a Craner designer. But the worm happened by luck and by chance over time? Wait a minute. If the computer had a Craner designer and the robot had a Craner designer and the 747 had a Craner, not only would the worm have to have a Craner designer, he, she, whatever it is, has to be much grander than whoever made these other three things. You see, it's very simple to figure out, but that leaves open a huge question. Who is this God? Okay, how do I find out who it is? And so one thing that hit me as I was doing all this research, um, when you study religions, all religions come down to a book, okay? The Jews come down to the Torah. Christians come down to the Bible. Uh, Muslims come down to what book? The Quran and the Hadith. Uh, Mormons come down to what? the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Bible, okay? So there were all these books. The Hindus have the Vedas and the Gatas, and there's all these books. I was like, whoa, stop. All I have to do is figure out which book is correct, and then I've got my answer. Okay, so I just had to figure out which one it was, and I could figure out who was the God of this creation. It says in the Old Testament in Isaiah, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. So he's saying, I'm the God you're going to meet when you die, but I need to know if the Bible is true. Correct? Correct? Now, how many people here have gone to college or have sent kids to college or 
You may go to college or you hate college. Any of those. Okay. I was at uh, Kansas State University speaking to 300 college students, and I asked them if they heard anything anti-God, anti-Jesus, or anti-Bible in one of their classrooms at Kansas State. 300 kids. How many hands went up? Yeah. It, they're ripping this book to shreds. The book you put your hand on to swear before you get on the stand, and then you lie when you get on the stand because you have no fear of the God of that book. Okay? I need to know if that book is true. Okay? So when, when I began to research on this and do this, okay, and I write about these in, in, in the books uh, that I have for you today and the booklets and stuff, I just have time to go through it all. But when you study history, there's not been any history in the Bible that's actually been shown to be untrue. They actually show the history of the Bible is true. Science, the Bible makes scientific statements. Do you know all of those have come 100% true? Um, science typically catches up to the Bible. Remember that. Sometimes we think science is ahead of us. No, they typically end up catching up to the Bible one day when you look at the science of the scriptures, okay? Uh, archaeology. Do you know they've had over 25,000 archaeological digs and finds in the Middle East, and every single one of those has proven the Bible to be true? That's fascinating. I was just reading this week that they've now dug up more archaeological finds uh, proving the exodus so remember the Jews were uh, in slavery in Egypt, and it was just this week they found a whole bunch more than when they were in slavery because the Jews this week are celebrating what? Passover, which has to do with, with them getting out of uh, Egypt and doing that, okay? The evidence is fascinating. That's all good, but the one thing that sets that book apart from every other book that's ever been created is something called fulfilled prophecies, okay? Now, there's a couple definitions to prophecy, but the simple definition is something said today that predicts something in the future, okay? Now, a fulfilled prophecy is something said today that what? Comes true in the future. See, anyone can predict the future. Astrologists, people who read palm readers, they can all predict the future, okay? The question is, can you get it right? That's the question, okay? So, um, if you're a Christian here, should we be sharing our faith in Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Yeah, we should be bold, never be ashamed of the gospel. So, uh, back in the day when I was younger, I used to snow ski a little bit, and so I was on this uh, ski lift and had a person next to me, and uh, I mean, I decided to witness to him. I mean, what's he going to do, jump? I mean, he's not going anywhere. <laughs> he's going to ride right to the top. I mean, no one's jumping. No one ever has jumped before. And he was, uh, he was an atheist from Scotland, okay, an atheist from Scotland. We're having a really good give and take. He had a lot of good questions, and you and I got a lot of really good what? Answers, but we have to meet these people somewhere along the way, and help with their questions, okay? So we're talking with this point in the conversation, and I told him, I said, the Bible, 25% of that book is future predicting events. And do you know that every single one of those has literally come true to the minutest of detail, except the future ones about the return of Jesus to planet Earth? I said, man can't predict, a uh, predict the future to 100% accuracy. Only who can do that? What did the atheist from Scotland say? Only who can do that? He said God. That's exactly right. He said God. Then he said to me, well, what are some of those prophecies that came true? That's a great question, isn't it? That's an excellent question. But we were right at the top, you know, where you have to pull your skis back so they don't clip off right at the top. I said, dude, I don't have enough time to get you those here. But if you ski off to the side right over there, I'll come bring you those prophecies. Okay? What did you do? He skied right over there and was waiting on me. We went over there. So I just walked through a few of them. It says, whoever this Messiah is, was born in the town of Bethlehem, okay? Not Jerusalem, not Atlanta, not Fort Myers, Bethlehem. Jesus born in Bethlehem. So whoever this Messiah is will be uh, sold for 30 pieces of silver, not 29, not 730. He was sold for exactly 30 pieces of silver. It says, whoever this Messiah is, will be pierced in his hands and his feet, okay? Psalm 22. That was actually written 800 years before crucifixion was used as a means of torture and punishment by the Romans. That's fascinating, okay? I was in uh, Atlanta. I used to have a bar section called Buckhead. I was witnessing this guy about 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm a night person. And uh, we were having this great conversation. He was really a nice guy, real open. 
And I was walking him through this in Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, and the piercing is the hands. And the dude went, dude, stop. He said, stop. I'm like, what? He said, dude, you know your stuff, man. He said, you know your stuff. Now, Christians, shouldn't we know our stuff? Yeah, the world's got great questions, and we need to help with the questions. But if you're here and you're not saved, I used to think this was all blind faith. And it's actually not. You take the evidence, and then you just put your faith on top of the evidence is all you do when you make your decision for Christ. And for you believers, you know what it is. You put the faith of a mustard seed, just a little bit of faith on top of the evidence, and you got what you're looking for, okay? Um, So uh, the Bible tells me there's a heaven or a hell. Well, that's pretty simple, right? Which place I would really want to go and do that. Um, Revelation 21 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Okay, so God says there's a place with no pain, no suffering, no mourning, no crying. Will anyone take that? I'll take that today. Okay, I'm serious. I'll take that today. But that's part of his promise of heaven. John 17 says... And this is life eternal, that they might know that thee are the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. He's actually telling you the best part of heaven is you get to be with God and Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. That's actually the best part to it, even though some of us don't. We just want the streets of gold or to see our relatives or something like that. He's saying, "Uh uh-uh, this is actually the best part. But it describes another place, too, called hell. And... The Bible calls it a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. That's where you've heard the term lake of fire before. Everlasting punishment. You go there because you rejected the mercy of God. Um, you folks have heard me before. No, I do uh, a little research and writing on near-death experience. And I told you, uh, you know, I've met people who saw the white lights and tunnels. But I am now up to 35 people I've met who flatline, who actually got the hell experience and not the heaven experience. In the latest one, 35, I was just at a, I'm having some heart problems, and I was at a cardiologist, and I was chatting with someone at the cardiologist's office. No one's heart is working there, right? That's why they're at a cardiologist. Wouldn't it be a great place to chat with people? <laughs> I mean, goodness. And uh, so I'm chatting with this guy. He told me he was on a jet ski, and he flipped the jet ski, hit himself in the eye. He's laying dead in the lake. Soul exits his body. He can see himself laying in the lake. He said, all of a sudden, darkness, complete darkness. He could see nothing. He said, evil, an evil presence surrounded him. He said he was scared to look right or left because he could could sense all this evil. Then he heard people screaming, wild screaming. People were in pain and screaming, screaming. Boop, he came back to his body. He was so happy to get back to his body. Okay, I'm at 35 who saw hell. If that's real, I want to go north instead of south, okay? I'm a very simple guy, very basic, okay? My question is, what separates one from the other? And so when you study the Bible, it tells you it's something called sin, okay? And what sin means, it's an archery term. It means missing the mark. So if you put a, an archery with a bullseye up here, and you keep shooting the arrow off to the side, you keep missing the mark. Does that make sense? If you've seen bow and arrow, okay. You're missing the mark. Uh, One easy way to look at it is uh, looking at the Ten Commandments, okay? So it's kind of a standard you can look at to see if you've made the mark or missed the mark, all right? So uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, You ever told a lie before? Okay, ever lied to mom and dad, lied to a teacher, lied to somebody, lied to a boss? If you told one lie, what would that make you? Make me a sinner or more specific, a liar at that moment, okay? You ever stole something before? I had a guy tell me, a waiter, I had, he told me no yesterday. And uh, I said, wait, did you ever cheat on a test in school? Because you stole an answer off someone else's test. You ever been at work and you should have been working and you weren't? You were stealing time from your employer. He or she was paying you and you weren't working for him, okay? So if you steal one thing, what would it make you? A thief at that moment, okay? Um, ever lusted in your heart after somebody, like you wanted to be with that person? Jesus said, even looking upon a woman with lust is the same as committing adultery in your heart. And this is when I knew I was in trouble. If you're checking the insides as well as the outsides, I've got trouble on my hands. Okay, I've got a lot of trouble on my hands, okay? Uh, ever been angry with somebody? The Bible says you've been angry without cause. It's the same as committing murder in your heart. 
but he's checking the insides as well as outsides. I do prison ministry work, and uh, I meet murderers. And every murder I met, anger first shot and killed their wife over something. Anger first knifed a buddy over a dice game. Because it's always insides that do lead us to outside action, correct? If you really study, it really is, okay? Uh, two months ago, I got a letter from, uh, do you remember the name uh, Mark Chapman? Yeah, he's the guy who shot John Lennon. And uh, he wrote me a letter um, two months ago. Um, he was reading one of my books in a prison in New York, so he shot me a letter. And uh, I sent him um, a letter back and a couple books. And then uh, uh, the chaplain just got a hold of me. We just sent up four cases of books to get out all through that prison because you don't have to convince him that he's done wrong. If you ever do prison ministry work, I highly recommend it. Uh, you don't have to convince prisoners they've done wrong, right? They're actually very easy to chat with, men's or women's prison. They're very open, and they're very thankful someone actually came into their prison. They're very lonely, and people don't come in and do that, but it's actually a great thing if you ever can get involved in prison ministry and do that, okay? Um, so uh, this was the standard. So a few years ago, I was in Orlando, and I ran into uh, Tiger Woods. And as I was chatting with Tiger... I said, Tiger, I always wanted to ask you a question. And he said, go for it. I said, Tiger, I said, when you die, I said, what do you think's on the other side? What do you think's out there when you walk out of here? And he literally stopped dead square in his tracks, stared at me and said, I don't know. And uh, we kept talking, and I walked him through the Ten Commandments, okay, so he could see his sin just like we just did. Because, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a green jacket it doesn't matter if you're wearing a green shirt today. It doesn't matter if you're a green speaker. All of us have broke those commandments, haven't we? It fits for everybody down here, okay? Now, um, I've got a verse for you here, and watch what James 2 says. And James 2 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay, so what it's saying is if you've broken one of the Ten Commandments, it's just like you broke what? all of them, because he's holy, and I'm not. And this was the promise I began to research this, okay? Do you have your Bibles with you today? Okay, so I want you to open your Bibles, and there's one in front of you too. So if it's underneath the seat in front of you, if you don't have one, I want you to go to the New Testament and go to the Gospel of John. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, we'll also pop them on the screen for you, a couple of these verses. But I want you to fumble through the Bible and know where these are at. Um, I never held a Bible in my hand until I was 20 years old. Uh, someone at Auburn University gave me a Bible. I never opened one before growing up. I was so thankful God wrote a table of contents so I could find anything in that book. I was the most lost puppy. Um, but once you fumble through enough, you begin to find things, you know where things are at. You never feel uncomfortable. So don't feel uncomfortable if you don't know where something's at. Just ask the person next to you. They'll help you walk to it. Because the other danger is, uh, I spoke at uh, Wheaton Academy. You heard of Wheaton College? There's a high school connected to it called Wheaton Academy. And I spoke there one time. I did a chapel for them. And so it was 600 students. I said, okay, go ahead and pull your Bibles out. Uh, they pulled out 598 phones, okay? And of course, two boys brought nothing and did that. Um, is there a day electronics may not work? Yeah, you got to know how to fumble through your Bible and do it, okay? You can't just always pull something up on your Bible. So go to John chapter 3, and go to the very last verse in John chapter 3. And it says, John 3 verse 36, okay? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. Okay? I was reading this verse one day, and it hit me. Uh, when I was a teenage boy acting a fool, I sure didn't want my mother's wrath upon me and do that. When I was playing terrible in basketball in college and stuff, I didn't want the wrath of my coach on me because I wasn't playing well. It hit me one day, I do not want the wrath of God upon me for a split second or for all of eternity when it's all said and done. So we have a sin debt by those Ten Commandments. How is the sin debt going to be paid off? Okay, think of it this way. If someone was going to come to you tomorrow, going to visit you at your house tomorrow, and they said, I'm going to pay off your entire credit card debt and your mortgage, okay, one, would you let them do it? Would you let them do it? That's easy. That's not like a tough question. That's a real simple one, okay? 
would you be thankful for it? I was putting this talk together, I was wrestling with some things. I was thinking about that, and what happened in my mind, I'm just a little different than most people, what happened in my mind was, wait, that happened tomorrow? So today I'm going to, what? Now let's go shopping and uh, <laughs> fill up that card a little bit because someone's going to, I mean, that literally went through my mind and did that. Um, but we would be thankful if someone paid off that entire debt for us, right? And that's actually what Jesus said he would do for us if you want that. He'll pay off your entire sin debt, past, present, future, forever and ever and ever, all right? Um, so uh, put up Acts chapter 20. I'll just read this one to you. Uh, Acts chapter 20, testifying both to Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is important. There's two big words here. Um, Acts 20, verse 25, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, so this goes for everybody, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. So the word repent, it just, it's a simple word. It just means a change of mind that leads to a change of direction, Okay. Change of mind that leads to a change of direction, okay? It doesn't mean you're perfect, but you know which direction you want to go. I had a guy describe it this way, and I thought it was a great way. So for you men, um, when you get married, okay, uh, 7 billion people on planet Earth, let's just say 3.5 billion ladies for the sake of argument. So you put your wife there, there's 3.5 billion women there, and fellas, you turn, and your focus is your wife. Is that correct, fellas? Fellas, okay, that's your focus. You need to invite me next week. I got another sermon I need to give you a group. Okay, your focus is here. Now, can Satan trick us to look away from that lady? Oh, sure, it can be somebody walking down the beach. It could be something that pops up on a website. But when that happens, you get right back focused on your wife again. Does that make sense? That's actually a great definition of repentance because as I try to serve God, there's times I'm going to get off track and I just repent and get back online. And there's the word faith. So repent and believe. Repent and believe. Okay? Now, this is the one thing I want stuck in your head before you walk out today. Okay? It's very simple. PBS. PBS. Now, why is that going to be easy to remember? Because of the television station. Okay, so PBS. Now, I'm going to define it differently, though, okay? Uh, P is perfect. B is blood. And S is sacrifice. So perfect blood sacrifice. Stick it in your head. Perfect blood sacrifice. Okay, watch. If you ever study Judaism, and Judaism is a fascinating faith, okay? If you ever study it, what they did was they took a lamb to the tent of meeting. And the lamb had to be perfect, not multicolored fur, just one color of the wool. Couldn't be a broken leg or nothing. It had to be the best of the best of the best. Okay? You took it to the tent of meeting. You put your hands on the lamb. And by faith, your sin transfers to the lamb. Okay? And then when they cut the throat of the lamb, the sacrifice of the lamb, that all your sins were remissed and gone. Perfect blood sacrifice. When I talked to Jews, I asked them, I said, do you still do the sacrifices for your sins. They say what? No, they don't do it anymore, okay? Why don't you do it? The reason they don't do it is because in 70 AD, a Titus, the Roman general, came through Jerusalem and bulldozed over the temple. Okay, so they don't have the temple there. But I'm a thinker. I was like, wait a minute now. If God demands a perfect blood sacrifice, I can't just do good works to be right with him. I can't do 10 hula hoops to be right with him. I need a perfect blood sacrifice. How am I can I figure this out? Well, what I did was I kept reading into the New Testament. We know the Bible's true, right? Through all the evidence and do it. So what it said was, is Jesus was perfect. He was tempted in all ways we were, yet without sin, which made him perfect. Okay, Leviticus 17, we'll just pop it on the board for you. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. You see? So when his blood was shed, it actually says in 1 John that his blood will cleanse you of all sins. Perfect blood. And then the cross that we celebrate, okay, is the sacrifice which um, the word in the Bible is propitiation, and just what it means is it pays off the sin debt. So you see the problem? We had the sin debt problem because we uh, broke the Ten Commandments. 
we'd accept somebody paying our credit card and mortgage, but will you accept the sin debt of what Jesus did on the cross, the perfect blood, what? Sacrifice for your sins, okay? I played uh, college basketball at Auburn University years ago, so I played at the same time uh, Charles Barkley was there. And one time I was visiting Charles in Phoenix, uh, they were playing the uh, Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan in the NBA Finals. So I went to the first game of the Finals out there, okay? A couple years later, the Dream Team, remember the Dream Team? They played in the Olympics in Atlanta, the gold medal game, okay? If I would take that NBA Finals ticket, all right, and go to the Georgia Dome in 1996 to go to the gold medal final game and walk up with the NBA Finals ticket, are they going to let me in? Nope. Nice ticket. Can't get you where you want to go, though. Think about that, okay? Um, Let's say you had, uh, this was a white shirt, okay? And I took a pen, I tap it 30 times. Is this still a pure white shirt? No, if I tap it once, is it still a pure white shirt? No, it's not, okay? See, God has a standard of holiness, and and I'm not, because that's why many times people choose, I'm going to be good enough to go to heaven. I'm going to say some Our Fathers and Hail Marys, and I'll be right. I'll confess my sins to a priest. I'll get baptized. And none of those are a perfect blood sacrifice. You've got to hand God the right thing the day you meet him to be right with him for eternity, okay? Uh, let's say you're in a mall, and... Uh, do you, do you all go to malls? Okay, I don't go. Nothing fits. So uh, I don't go. But if you go to a mall and your favorite store had 50% off today, would you buy anything? Oh, yeah, we're all going to get something at 50% off. Okay. Let's say your store today had 99% off. Would you get anything? We're getting friend stuff, aren't we? Hey, give me those Air Jordans, $1. Here you go, give them to a friend or whatever. You know, We're getting stuff for other people. You know what God says, though? I have 100% off on all your sins, past, present, future. And yet many people say, no thanks. I'll try to work my way there. I'll just be a good guy. Proverbs 21 says, men like to proclaim their own goodness. No, I'll proclaim to you how sorry of a human being I've been in my life, and thank God for the blood of Christ to wash me clean of it. It's the only hope I've got. I want you to study it and look it out, okay? I don't want to proclaim my own goodness and do that. A simple way to look at it, I was in a mall one day witnessing to a a teenager, and I couldn't couldn't get it through to him what we were talking about. So all of a sudden, someone walked out of the store, and and the buzzer went off. Hit me. I said, okay. So let's say you have a tag on your jeans and you come walking out the front of that store. I said, what would happen? He said, the buzzer would go off. I said, exactly. Word picture, gates of heaven, same way. Two sensors on the gates of heaven. When you go walking into heaven, only one thing would set the alarm off. It'd be all your what? Sins, exactly, okay. But if you were cleansed of all your sins, could you walk through the gates of heaven when you walk out of here? Straight on through, and the buzzer would never go off. Simple word picture, but if you've ever walked out of a store before, happened to me before, we weren't stealing anything. We just walked out, and they didn't take the tag off. But everyone, you, right? You didn't like that feeling when it happened. I was in a mall one day, and I was chatting with another teenager. And I said, uh, the, uh, I said so if, you, if there's a tag on your jeans, and you can walk out of the store, what would happen? He said, nothing. Figured out. I said, uh, no, no, if you had a tag on your jeans just like that and you came walking out of the store, I said, what would happen? He said, nothing. I said, what do you mean? He says, sir, if you take aluminum foil and wrap aluminum foil around it, you can walk straight. I was talking to a shoplifter in the middle of a mall, and um, when I asked him, have you ever stolen before? It was a really easy question for him because uh, he, that's how he's so. I learned all these tricks on how to get stuff out of the mall and uh, do that, okay? So we need that perfect blood sacrifice to do that, okay? So um, as I close it for you here, I've written a book called 10 Questions from the King. It's my latest book. Um, it's, uh, I've written seven books. We've had three people say this is their favorite book of all of the ones I've written. Um, I always teach people the two best ways to learn are to read and ask questions. That's the best way to learn. Well, I saw who has the best questions. And so knowing the Bible true, that has to be Jesus. And I found out he asked 135 questions in the New Testament. That fascinated the daylights out of me. And so I took 10 of them, just broke them down into real nice simple chapters on 10 of the, you know, who do you say that I am and things like that, okay? 
super fun book. And then I do these little mini books that have a lot of the evidence that I'm using today. So when you walk out of here today in the courtyard or over by the library, everybody gets something free, okay? Absolutely no charge. So visitors, you grab one of the books, uh, teenagers, it's more than one for a family, that's fine, we have enough. But everyone gets something free and no charge. There's also some in the courtyard for you and then in front of the bookstore as well, okay? Why would we do that? Because I go by what the Bible says. And Jesus said it's more blessed to give than what? Receive, okay? It is fun to bless people. It is fun to give people, okay? I always give a lost person when I chat. I always give them a book or something. And I had a guy one day at USC in California a couple years ago. He said, you're just giving this to me? He thought I was going to charge him for the book that I was I said, no, I want you to have the right answer. And just, it's yours, man. Enjoy. He said, I love to read. I'm going to enjoy this one and do that, okay? Christians should be givers and blessers, right? Too much people see Christianity as taking. No, no, we're giving, right? So watch what it says, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he what? It's all about giving, right? And he's the perfect example of it. It's all in the scriptures, okay? But back up for a second. For God so loved the world, okay? What it means is God so loved you, me, Okay, so I'm going to say it again, but instead of world, put your name in there. Actually, say your name out loud, okay? For God so loved Mark. Okay, one more time. For God so loved... You know the one thing all of us are looking for in this world? We're looking for love. We want our parents to love us unconditionally. We want our kids to love us. We want friends to truly love us unconditionally. But it hit me, God so loved this guy right here. This is what I've been searching for, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, okay? Think about that. We're going to live eternity somewhere. I just got to find out where it is, okay? So 1 Corinthians 15, we'll get ready to close for you here. 1 Corinthians 15, if you have your Bible and you go to 1 Corinthians 15, I'm gonna, it is, it's called the resurrection chapter. It's, it's, Paul wrote this to the church at Corinth. This chapter is just, it's so loaded. I got my final three verses or so for, from this one, okay? Um, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, gospel means good news, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, okay? Two, but which also you were saved, the gospel saves you. If you keep in memory when I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which was also received on how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It was predicted Jesus would do it, and it came true. That's fulfilled what? Prophecy, okay? And that he was buried, uh, death buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It was predicted he would get out of the grave, okay? And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. One guy emailed me this day, and he said, Mark, remember Sunday, the greatest day in the history of the world. I thought, ooh, that was strong. I like that. Because when he exited the grave, that means every one of us will exit the grave one day, either to heaven or either to hell, depending on what you do with the perfect blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But remember, he did this publicly. He appeared publicly. Twelve different recorded times he was out and about. They recorded him. These are the 500 here. So what he's saying is, hey, I saw Jesus uh, rise from the dead. What? Yeah, you can go talk to those people over there. So you could have other people to back up the account of what happened at that time. Do you know if you took each one of those 500 people, gave them six minutes to talk about the resurrection of Christ, you have over 50 hours of eyewitness testimony on the resurrection of Christ? That is fascinating to think about. So God's saying, here it all is, because here's the problem. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Now watch the problem. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, are yet, and you are yet in your sins. What he is saying is, if the tomb is still full of Jesus Christ's bones, and he didn't rise from the dead, your faith is in vain, it's worthless. It's Mickey Mouse, it's Donald Duck, it's a fairy tale. If that's the case, take your Bible, find the closest trash can you can, drop it in there, and get on with your life. Find out what the right answer is. 
But folks, all the evidence points to the tomb is empty and it's been empty for 2,000 years. Okay, and he's coming back one day. And before he comes back, I may meet him today. Okay, and if I do, I have got to be ready for that meeting. I've got to be ready for that meeting and do that. Hebrews 9, 27, is the point to another man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. Judgment day is coming for each one of us. I have to be ready for it, okay? So getting ready to close here. 1 Corinthians 15. So this is at the end of the same chapter. When I preach funerals, if the, if the, if the person is a believer, I almost always use this part of 1 Corinthians 15 in their funeral when I do it, Okay. First Corinthians 15, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, you're going to live forever. Then shall uh, be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Victory. Isn't it amazing how sometimes we're just so sad or distraught when someone passes away? And for some people, it can be years later, you're still dealing with the death of your mother, the death of your father, or boy, a death of a child. It can affect you so much, the ripple effect down the road. He's saying death is swallowed up in what? Victory. There has to be a reason this is in the Bible because there's a 100% chance I'm going to die, right? 100%? 10 out of 10 people die, right? I went to Auburn. I got this one figured out. Okay, that's easy. 10 out of 10. Verse 55. Oh, death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Look at 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So one, if you're born again and saved, death is a victory, okay? The funeral should be a celebration for another believer that dies, right? But that tells me I want every funeral to be a celebration. I don't want that sad funeral I got to preach at it and you don't know where they're at. Or you know where they're at and it's not good. Okay, no, he says, I'll give you the victory. But then for as much as you labor, not in vain in the Lord, that your works matter then after you get into heaven, then you get judged for those works and do that, okay? Uh, where's Nate? Nate. My friend Nate. Yes, hey, stand up for me, Nate. And um, uh, Nate came up to me this morning. All right, Nate, sit down. And uh, <laughs> I met Nate as a 16 or 17-year-old young man at a retreat in Michigan I was speaking at. And I actually remembered him. He was wearing a letter jacket, and uh, it was at a high school that had a pool, an indoor pool, and we don't do that down south, but they got indoor pools up north and stuff. And so Nate and I have just kept in touch through the years. And he came up, he's here with his uh, wife's family. He's got a little baby Henry and stuff. And, but he was telling me that um, he was in the investment world, got out of it. He decided to get in the ministry full time. And he's working with uh, um, uh, lower income people in the city of Detroit, uh, teaching people how to read, but also sharing who with them. Jesus Christ, you should have seen his countenance when I was chatting with him just a few minutes ago over here. He's excited. He loves life. He knows what he's doing has eternal value, okay? But isn't that the exciting part when you know you get to see somebody 14 years later when you first met him and they're serving the Lord and they're going for it? Aren't those the, the funerals you want to preach one day? I'm not saying I'm going to preach your funeral, though. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> but aren't those the ones you want to preach one day? But wait, shouldn't all of us as believers be finishing the race like that? That's the exciting part that we want to do, okay? All right, uh, can you guarantee me you're going to wake up tomorrow morning? No, you can't. And the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. You can't guarantee me you're going to wake up tomorrow morning. I was chatting with a, a lady at a gas station in Fort Myers yesterday. Uh, I asked her, hey, what do you think happened to you today? I said, I'm not sure. I said, are you born again or are you saved? She said, no. I said, what's holding you back? Bingo. We just started talking right at that gas pump. And I said, hey, can you guarantee me you're going to wake up tomorrow? She said, no. I said, no. Anything, and a gunman can walk in, a heart attack. You never know what's going to happen, car accident. You don't know. But that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Be careful if people tell you, hey, man, when I get older, I'm going to make this commitment. And I always tell them, 
If Jesus Christ is the right answer 20 years from now, he's the right answer what? Today. Don't play that game. If you're playing that game, it'll come haunt you one day. If you know the right answer, you don't do it. Okay, then Romans 10, 13, for so whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who's the whosoever? You and I. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so let's stand up. We've been sitting for a while. Let's stand up. And um, so remember, in, in the Bible, in a King James Bible, it uses the word asleep many times for death. I think it's a great word for death, actually. Because if you're asleep, eventually what? You just wake up on the other side. That's a great word for death, but you'll wake up in heaven or hell depending on what you do with Jesus, the perfect blood sacrifice for your sins, okay? So remember in life, as we look at this group, okay, there's two categories of people out here, okay? Not tall, not short, not male, not female, not white, black, Asian, Hispanic, not gators, seminoles, and hurricanes, or whatever, okay? There's two categories of people. There's lost and there's saved. That's it. That's everybody here. That's seven billion people on planet Earth, okay? Which category are you in? And maybe the real question is, which category do you want to be in? And what's holding you back from getting into the right category? Okay, so if you died today and you stood in front of God and he walked you through the Ten Commandments, if you'd be guilty by those Ten Commandments, just raise your hand up if you'd be guilty by those. Okay, now, without the perfect blood sacrifice, you're in serious trouble the moment you meet a holy God because you're not holy. You got, you got pen marks all over your white shirt. You need to be forgiven of all that sin and do that, okay? So uh, when they close up the service, they've got a prayer room over here. If today is the day you want to commit your life to, to Christ today, um, walk over here at the end and chat with the, the counselors they got here. Talk with somebody, and they'll show you how to commit your life to Christ and do that. We had someone this morning. If you have questions, if something didn't make sense this morning, okay, walk over here and talk with somebody. Um, we had one at the beach today. A young man walked back. And he had a couple questions. Something didn't make sense that I said. He asked me, he got it, he said, okay, I got it. I want to commit my life to Christ today. And he got saved over on the beach today, okay? But he had to go through. He, make sure you know what you believe and then make that decision for it. I've done a lot of cool things in my life. The best thing I ever did was repent of my sins, get born again and saved. And the moment I meet God, I get to hand him a perfect blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So that's why the Bible says today's the day of salvation. You're at church for some reason on Resurrection Sunday. If you get saved today, you'll never forget this day. Resurrection Sunday, 2019. You'll never forget that, okay? So last thing, remember... In the Old Testament, says God says, I set before you life and death. And he says what? Choose life is what he says. It's fascinating in Deuteronomy, okay? I set before you life and death. You have free will, correct? You have the choice to wake up today and come to church on Easter. You have the choice to go out to eat at a restaurant. If you're a believer, you have the choice to share your faith uh, with a waiter or waitress today. I had a great talk with the lady on the toll thing when I came over this morning. We had a fascinating talk, okay? Really nice lady, and she was really open, and she loved the Lord, and she loved the encouragement of meeting another believer that wasn't ashamed. I gave her a book, and she was real excited, so I get a chance to bless her and do that. I met a guy at my hotel before I left working behind the counter, who 5 o'clock in the morning, and he was there, night shift guy. Hey, what's your name? He said, Thomas. I said, have you ever heard the term doubting Thomas before? He said, you better believe I have, okay? I said, guess what? He said, what? Thomas doubts no more. He knows that the tomb is empty because he got to meet the resurrected Christ later in Luke, okay? But now he knows for sure because he's with him forever and ever and ever, okay? So remember, today's the day of salvation when we finish up. Come chat with somebody, guys to guys, girls to girls. Get your questions answered. Commit your life to Christ today. Last thing, remember, eternity is hurtling towards you. Now, maybe better say, you are hurtling towards eternity. It might be a better way to put it. I played college basketball 35 years ago. I cannot believe how quick 
35 years have gone by. I am scooting out of this place. That's okay. I know where I'm going. Okay? But I want to make sure a whole bunch of people there as well to sing songs in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for um, just a great chance to be here. Thank you for all the people who got up and came out on Resurrection Sunday. Father, thanks for your Bible that we know it's true and all we got to do is preach out of it and we know it's accurate. Father, take your Holy Spirit and draw the people that need to be drawn for biblical salvation today that they know when they meet you. They're not going to hand you good works and not going to hand you a confessional time. They're going to hand you the perfect blood, Jesus, uh, perfect blood sacrifice of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, draw the people to the books uh, and to get the ones that they want out there and, and the booklets. And Father, to the believers out here, put that spirit of boldness upon us that we won't be wimps for Jesus Christ, that 2019 is going to be the boldest year we've had yet serving you. And then we're going to finish the race well, take a last breath and enjoy you, God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, and the Holy Spirit forever and ever and ever. We ask it all in the great name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.